Okay, I'll speak from here if I may, rather than behind the podium. I'd always rather be a little bit more informal. I want to begin by thanking our distinguished director, Fred Bergston, for both hosting this event today and also for providing the resources or a piece of the resources to extend and confirm the work of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. We've been working with Trevor for about six months now, uh, but that's on the back end of a project which spanned four years. And I would say that we broadly come out with Trevor in virtually the same place. Some differences between our work and the IEA, I think not material, not at the level of interpretation, but broadly we've got good confirmation from Trevor that we're on top of existing analytical thinking and I believe we've also moved the knowledge in this business forward a good deal over this four-year effort, which was unusually extensive. It's a $15 million effort. 14 multinationals sponsored it. You heard some names before. Lafarge and UTC were the co-chairs together. Bruno Lafont, who's my counterpart, chief executive officer of Lafarge, is not here today. Jim Brazelton is here from Lafarge. He's their senior VP for sales and marketing for North America. And then we had 12 other companies along with us, and you heard some names before, like Pepco, Tokyo Electric Power, Electricity, and Gaz de France, uh, Philips, DuPont, people like that. So, credible, serious names. We had good staff work, of course, that went into that $15 million expenditure, a lot of computer support, and a really very good consensual program that extended across these 14 companies. We will do a manifesto under the headline of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in uh, next month or so, and that is going to wrap up and is going to, if not bind, it's going to certainly uh, put a fair amount of moral authority behind this study with respect to the actions that the, all of the members of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development will take together. Of course, we have here today Bjorn Stigson. Thank you, Bjorn, for being here, who is the president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We had four elements in this work and I'm going to cover four of them and perhaps focus on the last one a little bit more. We, did, we started with an inventory, I'll talk about that in a minute, inventory of all the buildings in the world. We did a survey, 1,400 professionals, we built a model, a big model, and then we spent some time trying to figure out what does all this mean in terms of interpretations and next steps. I'll begin with the model. We did the world's first ever statistical inventory of all of the residential and commercial buildings in six economic regions that comprise 75% of the world's GDP. That's a lot of numbers and a lot of words, but we took United States, European Union, Brazil, China, India, and Japan. Six economic regions, which is 75% of the world's GDP, and we did, again, this statistical inventory that didn't do it address by address by address, but it took categories of building types on study in these individual locations and it footed to 900 million buildings. Interesting comment is that of those 900 million, 100 million are commercial and 800 million are residential. And that, by the way, just begins, the size of those numbers begins to invite some questioning about the magnitude of the problem of implementing climate change with respect to decisions made by 900 million people. This inventory was specific as to size of building, type of building, end use, fuel type, location, therefore geography, and also energy efficiency of these structures reflecting the equipment installed, including things like insulation and fenestration and so forth. So very detailed, comprehensive, statistical inventory of 900 million buildings. We did a survey of 1,400 professionals. These were architects, developers, designers, engineers, owners, and we asked about the question of building green. That we were a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of answers, but I'll give you the highlight. The highlight was that, on average, this population of informed professionals overestimated the cost of building green by three times, 300%, and they underestimated the energy savings of building green by 50%, about half. So a complete miss, and that might cause us to conclude why People don't think the rates of return are too good, and why one of the things you're going to see in a few minutes is they're very large numbers of very attractive investments that have been present in front of building owners and decision makers now for decades, and they haven't done them. And you wonder why they have not done them. I think that's a principal conclusion earlier in the McKinsey work with this so-called uh, 
negative abatement cost, which really means financial return well above cost of capital. And same thing came out of our work, and it asked the big question, why don't people do what economic good sense would say that they should do? So we did the inventory, we did a survey, we built a model. The model's big and complicated, the way these things always are. In fact, it's so complicated, and it's got so many answers and so many different things in it, that it's really hard to get your bearings sometimes. And I'm always trying to do big picture things. That is, the model experts come in and say, OK, here's the output, and it's huge. And I'm saying, well, what does it mean? And then trying to cross check and cross foot and make sure that the number over here bears some reasonable semblance to the number over there. So we did a lot of that. And it's a big model. It's got 50,000 equations in it. More than that, actually, in working on 2.5 million data elements. So it's comprehensive and pretty good. And then on the back end of this work for the last year or so, we've said to ourselves, what does all of this mean? I said before, six economic regions in the world. We looked at five principal building types, although we have data on a lot more building types. The five principal building types are single family residential in the United States. The, we took southern states for that specific calculation and France. We did offices in the United States and in Japan. And we did multifamily residential in, in China, which of course is how that nation substantially lives. And then we put it all together and we did a whole bunch of output things, but the principal ones, of course, were the abatement numbers and the abatement cost calculations. And here is um, one of two charts I'm going to show you today. And that's a big summary of what we have here. And just to work you, this is it's kind of the McKinsey format, although it's got different uh, elements. It's basically a discounted rate of return where McKinsey shows abatement costs, positive and negative as compared with annual CO2 abated in 2050 in gigatons. And just to go back and recite a couple of Trevor's numbers again to put the big picture in perspective, the world carbon footprint today is 28 gigatons. It's headed under business as usual to 62 gigatons by 2050. The building's component of that today is 10 and a half gigatons out of 28 or 38 percent and that's headed to 21 gigatons by 2050 under a business as usual basis. Basically, these numbers for both buildings and for the world are going to double under business as usual between now and 2050. And then we apply the IPCC's 77 percent reduction target, and that's the number to stabilize climate temperatures. I've recalled it no more than 2 degrees C above uh, pre-industrial norms. And that 77 percent says you've got to get about 17 uh, 16, or 16 gigatons out of the 21 in the 2050 baseline for buildings. And the question is, how do you do it? And I think the notable things are here, which is, and also, by the way, we, we, one of the problems you have in, in problems like this is that everything is done in terms of averages. Averages can be highly misleading. And you can get, as we do, a positive abatement cost for buildings, the number is about $25 a ton is what is in the literature and, what we, and we found the same number. But of course you have to stratify that and go inside and say, okay, this is the grand total average abatement cost for buildings, but what about for say the best 25% of the investments and the next 25% and the next 25 and so forth. And then you pick out and say, okay, what's the goodness? And that's what this chart does. This chart picks out and looks at goodness. And we did it on the, I guess I'd say the accepted convention of uh, five-year payback periods with 6% discount rates. And for non-financial people here, what that means is you need to get your money back in five years, including a 6% rate of return on the money. And at the end of the five years, you're done and you go home. That's how it's typically done. Or you can take a 10-year discount, which is the same thing, get your money back in 10 years, including earning 6% per annum, and at the end of 10 years, you're done. And of course, what happens is most equipment investments have longer lives than that, more typically 20 years and the savings continue after that. So what you see here in those blue words are five and 10 year discounted paybacks. And just for convenience and for ways of thinking about it, they're converted to discounted cash flow rates of return with the presumption the equipment lasts for 20 years. So you put the money in today, you get savings for 20 years in a row, and then you look at the savings relative to the investment, and that is the discounted annual rate of return that you have. And I think it's a more effective way of thinking about this problem. And I think many people would think about investing at 11% DCF for 20 years, where they wouldn't think about investing with a five-year discount of payback at 6% per annum. 
different way of looking at it. It's the same thing financially, uh, but to me it's more meaningful and more attractive. So what we have here is the savings by different categories. Uh, this is by building and by technology. You see multifamily lighting. You see a little further over uh, single family office, single family uh, and small office heating, insulation, things like that. And you start out, what's notable, of course, is there's a bunch of stuff that's 100% rate of return, 30, 40, 50, like a whole lot of stuff, which to me that, once again, invites the question, this is, this is not new. This has been around for some time. So why do these things remain there as they are today? And I'll talk about some reasons in a couple of minutes about why and what to do about it. And then we get over, and this is Trevor's number, that uh, with the 10-year discounted payback period, that is 11% DCF, uh, that intersects the bottom at about 8.5 gigatons. And again, what we're looking for, the 77% reduction, and that's shown on the chart there, the IEA 77% target here at 15 gigatons. And we can get sort of halfway there with very attractive projects. And then the question is what to do about the balance. And there we come into a perhaps a more significant finding here, which is that we don't think um, after lots of review and study, and this is maybe a surprising conclusion to this group, we don't think active solar or PV solar actually pays, even with subsidies and even with technology evolutions and so forth. And so when we stack up the relative attractiveness of things that you can do, PV solar is a large quantity. It's basically done via residential applications with very large roof areas to so put PV solar in there and you put the excess electricity back into the grid and you sell it back and you get some credits and some money and so on and so forth, but you put it all together we regard that as a relatively less attractive way of reducing energy and therefore carbon footprint. Might also mention that the, uh, the investment cost to do all this in the first two categories, it's about a quarter of a trillion dollars a year um, in each of these two categories. That is the most attractive category, which is the five-year discounted payback, 21% DCF, takes about a quarter trillion a year to generate all that. And then the next tranche, which is the between five and 10 year payback, takes another quarter of a trillion a year. And as you see, you don't go too far to the right on the carbon curve, which is why the returns are coming down because it's getting less and less and less attractive. But still together, a half a trillion a year gets us eight and a half gigatons against the 2050 baseline on a financially attractive basis. I can convert these numbers also back into the standard carbon abatement cost numbers that people talk about. Uh, Trevor said, and I'll confirm that our study came up with a cost, a carbon cost abatement number for the building sector of 20, $25 a ton. That, by the way, compares quite favorably to industrials, which are about twice that level, and to transportation sector, which is about three times that level. So it's all pretty good. And I think what this all steers us to is that buildings are the highest single priority for carbon footprint reduction in front of all the things that are available to governments, industry, consumers worldwide. If we want to make a big bang early, you go to buildings, it's the lowest cost, and you go to the front end of the building stuff, which is what's on the left-hand side of this chart with very, very, very attractive rates of return. We also looked at the cost of carbon. The basic work was done here at a, at a constant energy price of, of $60 a barrel, oil equivalent, just to give us a baseline and an anchor. And then we looked at cost of carbon. And there is a surprising conclusion on that, which is the cost of carbon, at least at the levels talked about by governments around the world today, of, say, $40 a ton, somewhere like, somewhere like that, have a relatively small impact on total outcome. In fact, to be precise, we can reduce the carbon footprint against the 2050 baseline by 45 percent, that's the 8 out of the 15 that's shown there, reduce it by 45 percent with no carbon cost on a financially justified basis. At $40 a ton carbon cost, the number goes from 45 to 48 percent. It's not a big deal. Carbon, this, thing, this system is insensitive to carbon cost. I think that is a principle an important finding of this study. In fact, I will tell you also it caused the study team and certainly this participant in the study team to change my perspective from beginning to end of work. 
You, you might ask why it has relatively low impact. Well, here's one way of thinking about it. And just to throw another equation in here, it takes about two and a half barrels of oil to make a ton of CO2. That's a good kind of a working number, which is to say if you've got $40 a ton CO2, that's equivalent to $16 a barrel. $30 a ton is equivalent to $12 a barrel. Not that one of those numbers, look, thinking about our excursion between $40 and $140 and back to $70 a barrel for oil in the last 12 to 18 months, not that one of those numbers is big enough to move around consumption materially. Another way of thinking about it is that the savings which generate these returns are 5, 10, 15, and 20 years in the future. And so if you have a higher carbon cost, you have a higher savings of avoiding the carbon cost, but you have to wait a long time for it, which means the returns are financially insensitive. That's an important conclusion. The returns here are financially insensitive to the cost of carbon, at least as talked about in the literature and by governments currently of, say, 30 to $40 a ton. Another way of saying it is if you want to move this system, again, with financial motivation, if you want people to make decisions financially, you need a carbon cost per ton that's three digits going up and going up a lot. It's not a little. It's a lot. And that, again, is a principal finding. So what can we say about all these findings? I think first question, let me just do Q&A here with four of my own questions. Why haven't decision makers done what they evidently should have done on the left-hand side of the chart? Well, one is the one previously mentioned by Trevor, which is the split decision problem. That is, it's separation of decision makers and, and users and therefore payers of energy costs. And if they're separated, the person on the front end is after first cost. Least first cost, the person on the back end is after operating costs. If they're different people, then the equation never connects and you don't even get started on this kind of a calculation. Second one is the very, very large numbers of users. Go back to 900 million buildings. You're trying to influence the decisions of 900 million people, 800 million of whom are residential occupants. That's a fairly stiff challenge. It's not like you're talking to Con Edison or... TEPCO in Tokyo, you're talking to 900 million people. Another one is a problem I mentioned in the survey of overestimation of front-end costs and underestimation of savings of building green. And lastly is what I would call the time versus money problem and the small savings per month per house problem. Lots of things you could do in your own houses would save you $50 a month. And which one of us is going to go to a vote in the evening and a lot of time and study and literature and get contractors and get a quote and figure something out and make a decision to save $50 a month. You might decide not to go to Starbucks instead. So th that's a set of problems as to why this has not happened. And so then ask a second order question, which is if people haven't done it already in the face of very attractive returns, and if carbon cost of $30 to $40 a ton, either cap and trade or tax, doesn't move the equation around, much than what does. Because you could put a $40 a ton carbon cost in there for some of the stuff on the left-hand side and it would raise the return from 100% to 150%. If you didn't do it at 100, why would you do it at 150? Same thing. And so that's what led this group to come to lean more on codes and standards as the mechanism required to implement these carbon abatements. Because the market doesn't work already. And adding a carbon cost isn't going to make it work any better. So what are you going to do when you've got 900 million people to deal with, which is why we came to lean on codes and standards. In fact, I think there are, th there are three big levers we could talk about here, as I kind of wrap this up, of things we could do. There's carbon cost and cap and trade or tax or both. There's codes and standards. And last, there's R&D and technology initiatives. And all these things will move these equations around. I've talked a fair amount about carbon cost. Uh, I might just mention codes and standards. We do have codes and standards today. In the building area, there's the ASHRAE 90.1 code, which was last updated in uh, 2004. It's coming again in 2010. It gets into state and municipal regulation uh, via an act of Congress, via confirmation by DOE, via promulgation to the states and requirements to them to adopt model codes. 
might note that this 90.1 code, which applies to commercial buildings, is only half adopted in states today. 26 out of 50 have done it today. And then you have another second order problem, which is not even really very, very visible, which is the actual, the rubber meets the road when you have municipal building departments issuing permits and doing inspections. Now that's something that actually I, as an elevator person, know a fair amount about over many, many years, which is, and this is a good compare and contrast to this problem. We have in the United States substantially implemented, deployed, effective, and good building life safety codes. There's fire code, there's an elevator code. The elevator code, which I know intimately, is comprehensive. It's very precise. It says this is the kind of equipment you will build and how it will operate to provide that nice little aspect we have about elevators, which is we don't think about them as occupants. We use them as we would use a doorway or a staircase. We don't ever think about hazard. Why don't you think about hazard? Because you've got a century-old elevator code that guarantees you life safety and is implemented by building departments, permitting, and inspection mechanisms. And you have fire safety codes and whole lots of codes. You have air quality codes, lots of things that are like that. What you don't have is a building energy efficiency code. You may have it at the level of the Congress and DOE. You don't have it at the level of the municipal building department with permitting and with inspection. The linkages are so soft between those two, and it took a century to do the building life safety codes, and I think it's going to take, I hope not a century, but a long time to do building energy efficiency codes at the level of really, really being effective to move behavior around. That's yes, other small little things along the way. These, uh, the ASHRAE code runs to new building and to principal renovations, which were, would require permitting by a building department. It doesn't run to regular, normal, ongoing building, building operations, something that somebody might just do for the purposes of energy as compared to, to renew or to redo the space. It also doesn't run to operations at all of the system. You might note this, is you have, ele you have annual fire safety and elevator inspection codes, for example, in buildings. They send an inspector to say, is this stuff okay? Every year. They don't do that at all for building energy efficiency, not even contemplated. Nobody has the budget or the manpower of the people. And something we know on survey and study is that the operational effectiveness of building energy efficiency systems goes straight downhill from the day they're installed. They don't necessarily meet specification when installed, and believe me, they don't meet specification two, three, four, five years after. Think about your own residential security system. Think about your own residential climate control system. Does it meet the standards to which it was designed? And I would bet that most of us don't do that. And that's a big problem in this 900 million person population. Just to add, throw a few more words on the back end about uh, research and development and how this might uh, also move this equation around. Realize inside this there are lots of technology learning curves and we're predicting science of savings relative to capital equipment costs all in this model. The question is can we steepen those learning curves a lot? And I guess I'd leave you with a couple of uh, very big picture thoughts and invite us all, go back, all to go back to high school years for a moment or two and think about physics. And I assume you learned this in physics, or if you didn't, you should have. And one of the most basic equations in physics is delta E equals zero. The change in energy in the planet equals zero. And I'm excluding nuclear reactions out of that. But for physics as we know it, delta E is zero, which is to say, in words that we would think about, you can neither create nor consume energy. So you can't destroy it, you can't use it, but you can waste it. And what's wrong with this world is that we waste energy in truly vast quantities. In fact, on calculation, on study, we conclude that 91% of the input energy when it's measured in BTUs or some input force as it comes out of the ground, 91% of it never becomes useful work, as in the rotation of the wheels of your car, as in the hot air out of your hair dryer. It doesn't get there, it gets lost along the way. 91% is wasted, in part because we've had a century of free energy in America, and our conversion mechanisms aren't very good. One more thing that, to me, has a lot of appeal in the science and technology part of it is the following, which is if delta E is zero and you can't destroy energy, then why can't you recapture and reuse it over and over and over again? And we start to see that in the last five or ten years. I'll give you an example again from my own background in the elevator business. We build elevators today that regenerate. That is to say, they create power on the way down with the load 
for which they use power on their way up to lift the load. It turns out so you can build an elevator today of comparable capacity, like speed, like load today, and it's 75 percent less electric power consumption now than it was 10 years ago with a non-regenerative system. And in fact, the number in theory should be zero. You should use zero electric power in a perfect elevator system because what goes up comes down. And there is no energy loss. And of course, the 25% we're still left with is system inefficiency. It's friction, it's noise, it's things like that because you can't make it perfect. But the point is you can make it four times better. Hybrids are the same way. A big piece of the hybrids mileage gain is energy recapture because for the first time ever, you take the braking energy of the car, you put it back into the battery, and you use it again and again and again. And then we're back to Isaac Newton, who said the energy of deceleration is equal to and opposite to the energy of acceleration. And in the perfect world, you'd use no energy whatsoever for cars, like none. Of course, it's not a perfect world. So let me just, I want to just want to leave that uh, teaser. Maybe one last teaser is uh, central station power plants are 35% energy conversion efficient. That is, 35% of the energy going in actually comes out as electric power. And then you lose 7 or 8% more when you put it over high voltage transmission lines. And it goes out to noise and vibration and things like that. So the question is, back to the power plant, where did the 65% go? The answer went up the stack is waste heat. Because again, you cannot destroy energy. And what is not converted is wasted, in this case, waste heat. Well, one of the things that's coming, and there are systems that do this today, is where you do electric power generation on a site with a microturbine, and because you can use the heat right there, you can't move heat, but you can use it right there, you can use collateral uses like actually make air conditioning out of heat, you can do dehumidification, you can do secondary electric power, you can do space heating, and installations and systems work today at 80% conversion rates, that is physical conversion rates of BTUs to kilowatts and calories. 80%, which is up from 35% in central station power plants. OK, um, I'm done, although Fred asked me to, Fred pressed me for this. And let me just uh, put this last chart up. And I don't mean, I'm not, tout, I'm not touting this company. This is not a CEO talk you know, by the stock pitch at all. But this is what can be done. This is the carbon footprint of United Technologies Corporation over the last dozen years. And it's down by more than 25%. That's the red bars, down more than 25% even with revenues that have essentially tripled, 20 to 60 billion. So the energy intensity is down by 75% or so. And we did all this, by the way, with all that low-hanging fruit on the left-hand side of that chart. Virtually every single investment project we did in the last dozen years has got high positive rates of return, well in excess of the cost of capital, so it's got negative abatement cost. And the point about all this is that stuff can be done. And what we've got here is a problem not of science, maybe we've got a problem of politics, but we really have a problem of inertia by everybody. Because all this stuff is available, and it can be done right here and now. And that's why I come back that because decision makers don't do it on a voluntary basis with rates of return, then we need codes and standards to cause people to do this in the same way we have building life safety codes. Thank you very much. <laughs>